Nikon released the firmware version 4.0 and it has a lot of new items and fixes, but one of the items that really piqued my interest right off the bat was auto capture. It basically turns your camera into a camera trap. Now that's pretty cool. So that left me with two questions. Does it really work or is it just a gimmick? And how can I use it in the field here in Alaska for wildlife photography? Well, let's talk about it. Okay, what is this feature that Nikon is calling the auto capture on the Nikon Z9? It pretty much works like a game camera in the field. Once some subject enters the frame, the capture will trigger and start taking photos or video. Now how do we use this new feature? Well first, update your camera to the new 4.0 firmware. For taking photos, go into the menu under photos and there will be a new item at the bottom called auto capture. It'll be at the very bottom. For here you need to set the conditions that need to happen before the camera will trigger. The first section we need to set up is what types of triggers to use. We have the options of motion, subject type, and distance. By checking any of these, you now get the advanced menus that open up for each of these three items. You can even tell the camera what focus points to use, which means you can tell the camera to ignore certain areas of your image and look into other areas of your image. If you selected motion, which for wildlife we almost always will, you can now edit the motion options. You can now set how fast the motion detect and even the direction the motion comes in from and ignore other directions. Now we can also select our subject type, which of course will be animals. Now this part is pretty cool. If you have a person enter the frame, it will ignore the person and not take a shot as long as it's not detect an animal. So when I was taking some shots earlier we'll talk about, I had it set up on a turn and somebody walked in front of the camera. I didn't get a picture of the person, I only got the picture of my turns. You can also set how much of the frame the subject takes up. Set it to large to maybe capture moose and ignore birds and those type of things. Now you can also set the distance from the camera you want the auto capture to work in. So maybe the situation would be you set the distance to a perch and it'll only capture things that hit on the perch. It won't capture things that are in front of the perch or too far behind the perch. You can set it like three to six meters or four to eight feet, whatever you want to set it to. It only work in that amount of range of area. Next, if you want, you can set the area to concentrate on and other areas to ignore. And finally, you can set the timing to go to the shutter trigger. You can designate how long the shutter will engage and how long to wait before it checks the trigger mechanism again to initiate the shutter once again. Lots of moving parts there. So back to the questions. The first one was, does it work? And of course, before I tested all this, I did not read all the things that I just told you just now about how all the different parts work. So the first thing I did was I loaded up the new 4.0 firmware and had to figure out a quick way to test the auto capture and just see if the shutter would trigger on something, just see if it would trigger off. And I do have some magpies that come close to my house and they come on my deck and I decided that would be my first test. So I set up my camera and pointed at a plate on a table on my deck with some trail mix on it and set the auto capture with motion and subject. I left the motion at default and set the subject to capture be animals, no other adjustments. So to briefly test it, just to make sure that it was focusing and triggering, is I have a dove decoy that I use, and I just walk it out to it, put it in kind of into the frame by there, and sure enough, it focused on the eye and captured it. So I knew that it would trigger, it would capture on the bird before I just left it on its own to see if it catch the magpies. And so I set up with those two things. Again, I just set it to motion, default, and to capture animals, and that was it. So I walked away and left the camera sitting for a couple hours. And I came back and checked a bit later, and sure enough, it caught some magpies dropping in for a snack. And here's where I learned my first lesson for auto capture, your focus mode. I had it set to wide L, and that was too small for where I had it. And I had it just sitting just above the plate. So when the bird moved in, its head or body was a lot of times out of the box. And the autofocus struggled, as it should, because it didn't see enough of the animal to lock on in that box. But when it did get in the box and it locked on, it worked and it was fantastic. So it really worked well. And as you can see in these images, it hit and it missed. And when it hit, it was because it was in the frame and it still had a lock on it when it would fly it or fly out. So yes. So the first question was, yes, it triggered and yes, it worked. Now the next question that needs to be looked at is how can I use it for wildlife photography here in Alaska? This one is a little tricky. You see, in Alaska, we don't bait our subjects for the most part unless it's like in your backyard or something, and that is for a couple of reasons. One, it's illegal in a lot of areas to bait, 
and two bears and sometimes really big bears they have a very good sense of smell and even if you don't cause them to try to snack on yourself when you're out in the woods if you're leaving your camera out there they're going to snack on that camera they're going to smell the oils and the plastics in the camera and the scent from your fingers that you leave on your camera now we don't use blinds for the most part here in this part of alaska again because of subject number two before which is bears if you're in a blind you can't see beside you or behind you very well and you don't want to become a tasty burrito or play toy for said bears Okay, so what scenarios could I think of to test it or maybe future uses of this new neat feature that actually works on this thing so far just with default settings? First thing that comes to mind is something I'll be doing here in a couple weeks in Kodiak, which is puffins. Uh, and I can think about setting the camera up like when they're on a roosting spot or on a nest, I can set the Z9 up pointed to that spot and then I can use my Z8 or my R7 or whatever else to walk around or stalk around to get other nests or other birds in flight or things like that. For bears, moose, otters, etc., they're just way too random to me to set up a camera in trap spots with, you know, a $5,000 camera unless maybe I had a a trail that I know they're coming down or I, I know they're really frequenting. But also, since the camera's so expensive, you would have to be somewhere where you know nobody else is at or you can keep an eye on it the whole time. Now, if I ever found a den or anything like that, uh, that may work also, but it's pretty rare to run across a den, at least where I'm at. The next easy thing that came to mind was a perch on a limb that I may see birds coming to and returning to, and maybe a choke point on a marsh where a duck or a swan will be, you know it has to swim through. Those would be the cases that I could see that you could really use it. So I would probably, in those cases, like the choke point in the water, I'd probably set the camera up low to the water, aim to the spot where the birds will move through. And I actually had some swans do this. I knew they were going to come through, so I set the camera up and just left it. And with a bit of luck, it can capture the spot. So after all that said, basically the idea I had best was a perch idea. I knew one I could test as the Arctic terns have come back to Alaska. And the males love to grab a high perch near their nesting spot if they can and either rest or fish from that spot. And Potter's Marsh has turns that are fairly accessible and a few perches tame the camera towards. So off to Potter's Marsh I went to test it out. So each year when the terns come back, they like to roost, like I said, on the highest spots and they'll tend to roost on the signs that are around the marsh that tell you the rules of the marsh or what's going on in the marsh. So what people will do, they will tie uh, driftwood perches to them so the birds will perch on the driftwood and not on the signs so people get better pictures of them. And this made easy pickings for me as I could see there was one of the terns really using one of these perches. So I set up the camera and this time the only thing I changed was the auto focus mode this time. This time I used auto area AF mode to capture the entire field of view. I started the auto capture and wandered off to see what else I could capture with the Z8 while the Z9 was doing its thing with auto capture. I noticed the turn came back to perch a couple times and then when it flew off the third time I decided to go check the camera to see how it was working. And yep, it captured the turn and the change in autofocus worked out well as I didn't see any images out of focus. But I ended up learning my second lesson about the auto capture. I needed to set the amount of images it'd take and how long to wait until the camera could resume shooting if the subject was still there. What happened? Well, I ended up filling up the memory card with thousands of images of that turn just sitting in that one spot on the perch. So as the turn landed, the camera started firing, and since the turn never left, it never stopped shooting. It just stayed hammered down. So lesson learned. And that lesson is you've got to go in there and tell it how long to trigger the shutter and then stop, and then how long to wait before it started triggering again, or you'd have the issue I had where it it's shooting 20 frames a second to infinity. So I grabbed another Type B card, changed the timing options to do a five second burst and wait 10 seconds before attempting to shoot more images. So after about an hour and a half of just photographing the swans and the turns, whatever else kind of crossed my path, I came back and checked the camera and this time I got about a little over a thousand images of the turn flying in and out. So the changes, the timing of how the shutter would 
actuate and how long it would wait between checking the scenario again worked out great for this scenario. And then there's a third lesson they learned or discovered in reviewing the images. If I really wanted to capture the turn landing or taking off from the stick, I need to set the distance also. As you can see at a couple frames here that a turn flying farther behind the stick was captured and it really didn't hit the autofocus because it was moving too fast, too far behind. But the autofocus worked pretty well trying to get to that one as it went through and it racked out to it. And then when a turn came back to the stick, the autofocus came racked back to the stick. Now it missed a couple frames there because it was still trying to get the focus on it. But it's pretty cool to know the autofocus was working as intended how I set it up. But the one thing you definitely want to do when you're in perch is set that distance. So from this case, it probably would have been about uh, 8 to 12 feet is probably what I want to set it to, or 8 to 10 feet. It's probably 12 feet. Give a 4-foot buffer there between the front and the back of that stick. There was another issue that I noticed when I was using the auto capture. Now, maybe something that I'm setting up wrong on the camera with the defaults or something, but it's every time I started the auto capture, the autofocus point was not where I had it set before I started the auto capture. So each time when I started the auto capture, it was in a different focusing to a different spot, not where I was before I, you know, I focused, set the auto capture, then the focus is in a different area. So each time I hit the auto capture, I would have to change the manual focus back and get it back to the perch. And then it would pick up the birds because it was sitting out in this weird focus area in the bird land of the perch. It did not rack back to it, which was really weird. Uh, again, this could be me doing something wrong, but it was consistent and I probably need to do more testing on that. Now, one thing I want to tell you about when you set, you turn this auto capture on is you've got, you set all your settings on it, your shutter, your aperture, your ISO, your focus modes, all those things you set. Because once you hit the auto capture button, you can't change anything else on the camera. You can't change the autofocus. You can't hit the autofocus button. None of the buttons are going to work. The only thing you can change is your focus and if you have a zoom lens on, you're zooming your lens. You only work your lens. It's the only thing you do. Okay, now we know how it works. We can see that the tweaking in some situations helps get what we are after, as well as learning some things along the way through trial and error. Now what I want to know is, can I take all those lessons learned about the, the motion, the subject, the area, and the distance, and put all those items into practicality on something else I can find out there to shoot? The first attempt I was going to do, I was going to go out and do shorebirds out in a nail check and get them around the uh, little pools, tide pools they leave. And what my point was going to be is to point to an area where I was seeing birds move in and out all the time and let that auto capture do its thing while I ran around and did other photography. But of course, when I got in a nail check, as best laid plans are where the birds should be, when I got down there with the weather conditions and the temperatures and everything, there was no shorebirds to be found whatsoever. So... I had to change my plan, and as I was driving back towards Anchorage, just about a three-hour run down to this area, which made it even more fun to do it, I was trying to think of things that I could capture. I didn't want to do the turns again, but I was thinking, what else to do? And then I remembered that there's tree swallows all over these nesting boxes around Potter's Marsh on the boardwalk. So I said, you know what, let's go up there because the tree swallows are a lot faster birds, so it ought to be real interesting to see how much of it captured as they came in the frame as they go out of the frame. Because what I noticed with the turn was when the, the camera didn't trigger when it was flying in, unless it was coming from a different spot or going slow, it really captured right when it landed on the perch. And sometimes with its feet off the perch, but it's really close to perch. So uh, it took a second for it to trigger is what I'm getting at. So I want to see how these tree swallows would do with this auto capture. So when I got closer back to Anchorage, I made the turn into Potter's Marsh over by the boardwalk. And it's a really nice place to go. If you ever come to Anchorage, go to the boardwalk on, at Potter's Marsh, and you'll see a lot of animals and birds. It's really cool. Really neat area. So I walked down the boardwalk. I came out to a couple of the nesting boxes. And sure enough, there was tree swallows all over these boxes. So I aimed it at one of the corners of the boxes where I kept seeing a lot of birds going in and out of. And I set the camera up as follows. I just set the motion, left the motion at default, set the subject up again. And this time I set up the distance on this from uh, five to eight meters, set it that way, and let it do its thing. And it came out really neat because a lot of times in these images, what we're getting, let's just review them for giggles real quick. Slide over here to this laptop. So what I noticed in some of the images, just like before, when I had it at uh, four to eight meters, 
it uh, this time it was out of focus in the first couple shots as you see here but in the third and fourth shot it started catching up and that's because I had it set to four to eight meters which is quite a bit so that's what around 12 feet to 24 feet 12 foot so I really had that box way too narrow but it worked out okay as you can see here in these images real quickly uh, and these are unedited these are I'm using fast draw viewer to show this to you it doesn't pull up a real high res image of these things but and captured it well as we zoom in we have pretty good detail and of course this is some uh, tree swallow porn here for you because uh, they kept coming in mating, but it captured it all. It was really neat. You know, I probably could have ran the shutter myself on this, but I may have missed it because it happened so fast. I may have missed this just by trying to hit the shutter. It was auto capture. Captured the whole sequence of the mating and going away. Pretty cool. And you see, and then, again, I had a five-second burst at 10 seconds. I forgot to tell you that a second ago. So that was my parameter. Run a five second burst, which gets about 120 some images, and then it would stop, wait 10 seconds, and start firing again. And we'll see if we can find that break. So here it comes in again. This is because there's, there's a break somewhere here, but she just stayed on that perch. Came in again. A little mate, and he's back out again here in a second, I'm sure. So that's what it was. You notice right here. When he flew off, the autofocus apparently was hitting him. And as he flies off, it has him. You notice she goes out of focus. And there it is. She's out of focus. As he comes back in again, what's interesting, it tracked him first. Right there. She's out of focus as he comes in. Both out of focus. So it got confused when it got close. So this is just a Nikon autofocus thing. Um, there he goes. Away. And they're both kind of out of focus. A little bit in focus every once in a while, but mostly out of focus. But pretty neat that it was triggering, but um, just not in focus. So let's go on out here. I think there's another example I wanted to show you here. Really interesting. She stays out of focus and it goes in focus, probably because she wasn't moving. This is the shot. So again, since I had it four meters, she's in focus. You see the wings of a bird on the right. And then it locked onto him as he comes through. So it changed from her, caught him moving because of the motion, because she's not moving, but he is. And it caught that one going through the frame. And does it come back? And then it came back to her. Now, again, these are 20 frames a second. So this is happening extremely fast. So you see like two out of focus. You got to remember that's like a, not even a 10, not even a fifth of a second is what's happening between frames. I don't know what the exact math, but it's fast. So yes, it tracked these tree swallows really well. Um, I did angle it to the other direction and changed a couple settings. So now what I did, I focus area much narrower. I gave it a two foot buffer between where this was at and that. So we go back to these images, you can see how the auto capture caught this guy flying by the box, which is really cool. He's flying by the box, not landing on the box. Keep going, see what else we see here. See this thing ticked off the 10 frames a second at five, so it took off a ton of 120 some frames there a burst. So you may want to do your burst a little less. And uh, here it is again with the with the tree swallow. You want to call them turns. One coming out of the box, another one landing on the box. So this all happened instantly when it triggered and there they go and it went to it's like I said sometimes it gets a little confused it's, it's on the back bird and then it loses both birds when it's trying to focus then it gets right back in focus so really fast so every once in a while you have one in a frame so like she's in focus out for some reason everything went off out then right back in focus the very next frame so really interesting how that happens but this thing constantly track the birds really well this this scenario is a little easier because I was tighter in the box so it kind of stayed in that same you can see back here one flew by so there's a it stayed on the bird in the front you'll see one go behind the box there you see at the top right uh, and there's another one going by so it's staying in the right area it wasn't focusing past the two foot barrier I gave it behind it so yeah, really cool. It it actually worked in the scenario I put it in. It worked. Now again, you see there here. I'm firing off 120 frames, and you see it there went in and out of focus every once in a while. I don't know why it does that, um, but 
it is what it is. There's probably some settings I could change. I could probably put it on, if I was really con concentrating on just that uh, hole in the box, I could have just gave it that as a wide L and only concentrate on that area. But I wanted them flying in and flying out or landing on top too. So I didn't want to narrow that uh, area it was flying to. You can see I kept, I was getting them pretty good coming in and out of that box. I'm trying to see if I have any landing on top here because I haven't reviewed these images yet. Got a lot of dead frames here. Um, you got to remember at five second burst, I'm getting 120. That is interesting how it uh, pulses and loses the focus on that bird. Maybe because I have subject detect on, it doesn't, doesn't recognize right there that it's a bird anymore. It's probably why. Probably when it was flying into the frame prior to this shot here, that one there, it probably saw it when it's flying in frame and said, oh, I see a bird. It had to focus and it tracked that bird. But once it stuck its head in the hole that far, it says, I don't see a bird anymore. And it didn't know where to focus and it hunted for a second. Then it went right back to that bird box because it focused on the bird box, not the bird. Anything that's focused on a bird box that the aperture had, it would be in, in focus there. So let's see what else we find. So again, this firing is five second burst, 120 some frames. That's what we're looking at, and there it is. Same thing, it, it focused this bird really well because it stopped before it went in the box. And this one stayed in focus the whole time. So what else we got? Yep, same thing. Looking for something different. So that was interesting. So this worked out well because as this bird enters the frame here, it's behind my two foot worth of uh, focus area I told it to work on. So this worked exactly how I wanted it to. This is why before I had it four feet or 12 feet, excuse me, so I would capture that bird in the frame. But I was only wanting things that landed on this perch, not things went behind it. So this worked well because it did not pick that bird up because it's outside of the parameters I set up for the auto capture. I only gave it a two foot box. The bird was behind the box. It didn't go to it, it didn't detect it, which is good. That's what I wanted. Here he is flying back in. So you see one going out. So you can see when that thing says to trigger, it's just these birds are so fast that it didn't capture it sticking its head out because these birds just go like that. When the one goes in, one goes out when they're on that nest because they're, I believe there's eggs in there right now. They're not hatched yet, but they're in there because they'll be sticking their head out one food yet. So they're going back in, checking the nest. Looking for more stuff again. Another one flying in. Let's see back here, went past that. Yeah, it's again, uh, this one actually caught a little quicker when he's darting out. Because they, when they dart out, they just got their wings and fly out of there quick. And sometimes you don't even notice one flew out in, when you're watching with your eyes. So it's neat that it captured that at 20 frames a second. Right, moving on, see what else we can see. La, la, la. Hopefully the wind's not messing up my auto in this video. Then when another one went in there. It's a little windy up here on this hill and the weather's... I'm trying to see a little bit of blue sky, but it's supposed to be pretty crappy and rainy today. Yeah, that's all the shots I had on that there. So, um, really, really cool. But let's go back to the Arctic Turn, see if I can find it here. There were pretty cool shots on the Arctic Turn when it landed in. But most times it caught it right when it hit the stick. There's a few times where it did capture uh, the takeoff and the land. So, like... Uh, right here he's about to take off clip the wings my exposure a little hot i really didn't look at my exposure too much i just really was trying to get the auto capture to work but you know this is an example of um, if i was paying attention more i would have probably zoomed that back out a little more to capture full wings if i was really after some shots but pretty neat that it caught that one so let's see there was one i think in here yeah another example of um, have it on the wrong spot was they sometimes this guy would land on the back side of the stick and I love how it looks like he's dancing here getting slick on that stick looking at me um just in the wrong spot with the wings um let's see what else there was one where it actually caught him um 
of the takeoffs in there. But that's not what I'm looking for. You can see here at 20 frames a second, you know, you're just sitting there. Ah, here it is. Here's where he comes in land. So this was the end of one shot. This started the next burst. When he came in, it actually caught him because he slowed down to land on that stick. And that's kind of what you're after with the auto capture stuff that you probably couldn't capture. And this image I would would have been really hard to capture by sitting there and shooting. You probably could track him in there, but you may have turned or clipped or something. But since you kind of can have your shot framed up, Really cool with his feet off of it right there, right before he landed. And there's the takeoff. So you can get some of these shots. Again, clipping the wings. Pretty neat little wing pose. Not anything I'd write home about, but uh, the potential's there is what I'm getting at. Okay, now let's answer all the questions we had before we start this video. The first thing, uh, does the auto capture on the Z9 work? Yes, it works, and it works quite well. It works as we're telling her to work. Can I find a way to use it in Alaska to not bait it or use blinds? And the answer is yes. And I've got a couple ideas of what I want to use it when I go to Kodiak. So I'll probably make another video about auto capture, how I use it in Kodiak when I'm concentrating on some birds or the puffin nest, hopefully. So yes, there are some ways I can use it in Alaska, but it's, it's kind of narrow. Now to the final question on this auto capture for the Nikon Z9 that uh, a lot of people really want to know. Is it really a useful tool for wildlife photography or is it just kind of a little toy or gimmicky thing that's just kind of fun to use every once in a while? Well, I'd have to say I don't think it's really just a little gimmick. It's a really useful tool. Now, it's an expensive and dedicated tool and you have to really plan on how to use it, where to set it up. But I like it and I found it really useful to be able to leave it pointed at the turn on its perch and sit close by where I'm not bothering that perch and to photograph the other birds and things was pretty cool. I was able to capture two scenes at once. And to be able to take it out there and put it in those turn boxes, it was pretty valuable because I could put on those turn boxes and I could be photographing other stuff like I was doing and look at other turns and other things while that one was just doing its thing over there taking those pictures. I was able to capture stills and video of the birds and especially those swans as they swam by when I put that camera next to that choke point because if I had been sitting there, I would have caused those swans to go farther away from me and not be able to get that close a shot with them. Actually, a couple of shots, I couldn't get the parents in the frame. I could only get the signals in the frame. But they ignored the camera because I wasn't sitting next to it, and they came closer, and I got the shots of those swans as they flew, swam by, flew by, swam by in that choke point. Now, what are the downsides using the Z9 for this purpose? Well, Mainly it's a five and a half thousand dollar camera, and it may be your only or best camera. You won't want to relegate it to be just the camera trap. You may need it to move around into different areas and angles to track whatever else you're after. And secondly, it's a framing factor issue. On the perch, you can kind of guess where you want to set your frame, but in a couple of images, you can see the turn didn't land on the frame where I really wanted to go. It landed off the right side of the frame. So a little bit of problem there and I didn't have it as wide because when he would land on the perch or coming in landing he would get it but if he changed his angle his wings would be out of frame so you really have to think about that framing issue and as far as like when I set my depth of field on the tree swallows you see a few times when a bird went flying by it didn't capture it because it was too narrow things like that so there's a lot of luck in framing the bouquet depth of field etc that if you were in control of the camera yourself you could set those things on the fly but in this setup as an auto capture camera trap, you have to set all those configurations up in the beginning. And you hope that you set those parameters correctly and the dice come up right on the image. But it's a great tool to have in your bag. So to me, that's a win. I for sure don't have all the tips and tricks for auto capture figured out, but I have learned a few lessons on how to use it. But with more time, we'll all find out ingenious ways to use this tool. And as always, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. And until next time, get out and run that shutter.